So, um, I'm not an actor at all. I'm really a writer who just acts occasionally. To create a character, all you have to do is really get the hair right, the costume right, put a moustache on, and then get the voice right. That's, I think, caricature acting, not real emotional acting. On Monty Python's Flying Circus, what was really good about it is I was acting with Cleese, who's an impeccable actor. Michael Palin, who's a very, very good actor. Chapman is a real natural actor. And Terry Jones, who was a very good comic actor. So when you're in a group, you start copying or you, you're lifted up by their performances. And that encourages you to go a bit further and be more confident in doing what you're doing. And this was one of the first things I actually auditioned for the Pythons. We'd audition our sketches. It was sort of based on two things. There was uh, Vivian Stanshaw from the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band would always do a bit of that. And also there was a character in my pub at home called Monty. It was why we named the show Monty, actually. He had a little bow tie and he was very jolly. He was always on life and soul of the party. It's a very popular character. It was played on American television when we recorded it in 1973 on the Midnight Special, and Elvis called everybody Squire because of that fucking sketch, which is amazing to me. I just nearly died when I found that out. I was just love, love that. Not I mean Squire, eh? So the, and Elvis used to do fucking Python sketches in bed with his girlfriend, Linda Thompson, at night, including the Pepperbots. Oh, hello, dear! Oh, if only there was footage. <laughs> the Richard sketch um, I wrote with John Cleese, and uh, one of the rare things I wrote with John, it occurred to me a lot of Australians were called Bruce, because I had a lot of Australian friends. And that's the idea that everybody's called Bruce. Hello, Bruce. How are you, Bruce? Big crook, Bruce. Where's Bruce? It's kind of fun when everybody talks the same and everybody's called the same. I think the best thing, it, it turned into a, a song, the Philosopher's Song, which I really liked. I think I think I had the most fun at the Hollywood Bowl when I played that character, because I could add lib in that character, you know, Bruce. And I said, you know, look at this, the Hollywood Bowl. It's a typical Hollywood crowd. All the kids are on drugs and all the adults are on roller skates. <laughs> so I think it was true of that time. That's a sketch written by John and Graham. I wrote the second half of, and it gets into a long rant, which I really love, the rant. It go, I, used to, I had to learn it, and so it was page after page. He, he won't stop talking. And Michael Palin spends all the interview trying to stop him talking. Shut up, go away. I like smoke too much. It was very good. I could do that up to about the age of 65 or 62. And then he's just, just like, huh. I can't do this monologue any longer. It's about 10 minute monologue. I think Python pretty largely was about television. It was on television and it was about television. It was reflected all the sort of shows that were on television. And the money program was a real program. And it's so the money program is about money, talking about money, Deutsche Mark, and, and he just then gets up and goes into this beautiful song and dance. And all these singers come on dressed as Welsh ladies for reasons of uh, I don't think there are any reasons. And I wrote, it was one, I think the first, almost the first song I did on Python. I, I kind of enjoyed doing that song. I like that song. Money, 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 money. The Ruttles, which was called All You Need Is Cash. The world's first mockumentary, by the way. I had done a clip of The Ruttles with a song Neil Innes wrote and they played it on Saturday Night Live when I first did it in about 76, maybe. And it's a bit I'd written, and it's about an interviewer talking very sincerely to camera. And he's talking, and the camera starts to move away, and he moves towards it, as they do, and you keep walking, walking, and then the camera would go faster and faster and faster and ended up running down the street. And then Lorne Michael said to me, what are you doing next? I said, well, I think I'm, that might make a whole documentary. I'm doing it on BBC Two. And he said, no, make it for NBC with me, and you'll get a much bigger budget. It was fun. I got Neil Innes to write 12 new Beatles songs. I didn't have a lead. I didn't have a Paul. And so I sort of backed into playing that role as well, which I didn't really want to. But when I did, it was interesting to study Paul. I think his wife liked it the most. Linda loved that performance because he's, look, he's playing with his eyes and he's, shoot me down in flames if I could tell a lie. So it's really a parody of documentary style talking. People talk very interestingly to camera and they emphasize words that wouldn't 
normally be emphasized. <laughs> they talk like that. Why? I don't know. And it was later used by, stolen by, The Simpsons, which I did in exactly the same manner. He's supposed to be making documentaries, talking to camera about The Simpsons. Well, if you want, I can cut you out of the film. No, 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 no. It was fun playing the Beatles. I mean, it was really fun going, dressing up in the streets and running around. And um, I liked that. It was the most, probably one of the most fun times I ever had filming. <laughs> the Holy Grail was the most miserable time. I mean, it was fucking awful. We're up in Scotland. The day before we went filming, the Scottish National Commission of something decided we were not allowed to use their castles any of them. So we were stuck with one castle called Dune Castle, which we shot from every single bloody act, which was in private hand. And now it's a tourist trap. You, know, you can go there and go into every scene from the Holy Grail. They've got it all set up, which I'm very happy for. I think it's funny because it was unpleasant. And un I think uncomfortable is very good for comedy. And not enough money is excellent for comedy. <laughs> I think that was just a cadence I heard. Bring out your dead. You know, boing. Bring out your dead. The dead collector, did he haven't even have a name? See, a lot of our characters are man number three, person in queue, <laughs> man with hair on fire. Cleese had the funniest bit because he's bringing out this man on his shoulder. He says he's not dead. Yes, he is. I'm not. So it's kind of, Again, so two people haggling about somebody else who they want to throw on the cart. And I think the only good thing about the dead collector is I actually have one of the very few genuine ad libs in Python. And somebody said, Who's that then? I said, He's a king. I said, Why? He said, He hasn't got shit all over him. And that was a genuine ad lib because we were writers. We didn't own ad lib on our fucking films, you know, mate. You write the, do the script. <laughs> we each got to play a knight. And mine was Sir Robin, and he's just basically a coward. <laughs> it's kind of fun to play a coward, you know. I think it's quite nice because I wrote that song. Bravely bold Sir Robin ran forth from Camelot. And he's very enjoying this, and he was not at all afraid to have his legs, legs cacked off and his bottom burned out. It's like one of those things you, you're going to just reveal growing unhappiness with the song. Brave Sir Robin ran away. No! Sir Robin had. A thing I wrote, which is not very good. It's like a three-headed knight, but they're bickering all the time. It didn't make the musical. Oh, yes, this is my favourite. And that scene is all one take. That's why it's funny. Cleese says always, the funniest thing is stupidity. Mike is saying, right, guards, stay here, and I'll come back in a minute. And, and mine just is very stupid. He said, not to leave the room until you or anybody, not anybody else. So he's trying to understand. He's North Country. He's from the Yorkshire. But he can't really understand the instructions just to stay here. He's just, just playing stupid, really, is all it is. And it's delicious fun to play. And Graham, all he's doing is hick. <laughs> he just does hicks. But he times them so perfectly, it never treads on a laugh. It never treads on a line. And it's how not to upstage people. <laughs> It's a perfect lesson in that. <laughs> Nearly departed, which was very quickly departed. Well, I remember very little of this. Um, <laughs> it was a sitcom. They came to me and said, would you play a ghost who haunts this place? We did it for a bit and it wasn't very funny. And I said to them, look, the only way this would be funny is if this was a black family and they're haunted by this fucking awful English professor, white guy, hanging around, that would be funny. And they said, well, we can't do that. Ooh, no, we can't do that. It's America. I think that was what was wrong with the, the script. There wasn't enough conflict. There has to be real conflict to be funny. I think it only lasted about six, and I think they only broadcast about three. I'm not good at sitcom. I, I, I hate it. I'm no good at it. I've done it twice, and both times it was disastrous. <laughs> so don't ask me. Okay, I won't do it. <laughs> the Life of Brian came out of an ad lib I made when a journalist asked me what our next movie was going to be. I said, Jesus Christ, lust for glory. John Cleese said, I think that's very interesting. Nobody's ever been funny about religion. We read the Dead Sea Scrolls, we studied texts, we studied terrible Hollywood movies, you know. Surely this man is the son of God. And so our movie is a kind of parody of a Hollywood biblical epic. And we realized we couldn't really write about JC because there's nothing you can complain about. A man saying, you know, blessed are the poor, feed and help people. There was something more interesting about exploring 
what followers of a religion do, both to the religion and to the people they follow, and how unhealthy that becomes. Well, Mr. Cheeky is based on our sparks, the electric lighting guys. They're sort of people you want in the trenches. Nothing would get them down. So we wrote this sort of character, Mr. Cheeky's called based on that, you know. He said, crucifixion? He said, no, no. They said, I could go free and live on an island somewhere. Jolly good, well, off you go then. Nah, man, you put in your leg. It's crucifixion, really. We had ended the film with a song which I'd written, and I'd done the demo, and it wasn't very good. It was like, some things in life are bad, and they can really, it was sung very straight and rather boringly. And I realised that the song should be sung by the character I was playing because he's been crucified. Yeah, some things in life are bad, I can really muck you, Matt. It's much funnier because <laughs> it's giving an ironic background to the song. Always look on the bright side of life. Come on! I think this is amazing how prescient Stan, a.k.a. Loretta, is because he's... a uh, a sort of transgender person appearing suddenly in the life of Brian. I realised that I would have to play it very sincerely and that he'd have to mean that I want to be a woman. I want to have a baby. It has to be believable. He has to want to have a baby. And he said, well, where are you going to keep the fetus? Are you going to keep it in a box? Where's it going to gestate? Don't you oppress me. I'm not oppressing you, Stan. I've got a womb. It deals with, I think, from 1978... It's very germane at, this, at the particular at this moment in time. John Dupre and I, after Spamalot, we adapted The Life of Brian as an oratorio. And so we wrote a song called I Want to Be a Girl for Stan, which is very sweet and very tender. I want to be a girl. Mike Nichols, who was very severe about this, would always say to the actors, you must believe in what you're doing, because if you don't believe in it, why would you expect the audience to? And I said, Mike, you're talking about the knights who say me. <laughs> and he said, nevertheless, they must believe they are the knights who say me. The Adventures of Baron Munchausen. <laughs> Six months of hell under Gilliam. You know, it was a disaster. We drove down from France to, and they said, oh, we've delayed the shooting two weeks. And he said, well, couldn't you have told us? We're here now. And it was one of those films where everything went wrong. Just absolutely everything. He didn't have enough money. It was made in three languages, and Italian, English, and Spanish. Uh, you know, I say in my book, I would rather go back to boarding school than back into Munchausen. And they shaved my head every day, which is great. And Gilliam lied, said if I shave my head, he'd shave his. Liar. I shaved my head, he said, good, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> there were three ages... And sometimes you'd be made up for three hours first thing in the morning and you turn up and say, oh, no, 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 you're supposed to be young today. He likes to create chaos because he's an animator and he's only happy when there's chaos and he's solving it. But for the rest of us who are the chaos, it was not so much fun. <laughs> I don't remember very much about that character except when I tried on the costume. They had these huge thighs. I said to the wardrobe lady, it looks like he's got no dick. Get me an artificial dick. And she knitted one and stuck it in there. So I thought that was the motivation for this character. He had big thighs and a huge dick. <laughs> I kept the dick, by the way. I have that dick still. <laughs> and being Italian, they'd also knitted the ball. So it's really nice. The cazzo. Testa di cazzo. Which I think means dickhead in Italian. Casper. I think Spielberg produced it and they asked me if I'd be in this movie. It's a, a special effects film, so there's hours of waiting around, which you remember more than the actual acting bits because it's much longer. And I don't remember much about Dibs. I don't think I've seen it for a while. He was playing the boyfriend, or a wannabe boyfriend of Kathy Moriarty, I think. And this is Dibs. Hello. But I don't remember very much about the movie at all, actually. Except, you know, there were some nice people around. <laughs> Alan Smithy is the name that the uh, Guild put on a film when the director's taken his name off it. And so I was playing Alan Smithy, the eponymous director, and what he does in the story is he steals the film. He just steals it and runs away with it. And, and the first cut was actually quite, quite interesting. It's directed by Arthur Hiller, who directed Love Story, and he has Ryan O'Neill in it with me. Was, was Bruce Willis in it? You know, they had real people in it all over the place. And it was sort of semi-documentary. 
But Arthur Hiller tried to make it real. He tried to put emotion in, um, which I thought was a, a very right way to go with it until they fired him. So Alan Smithy became the director of the Alan Smithy film. I actually, I'm rather disappointed because I didn't get a Razzie nomination. And it got five Razzie nominations. I think it won all five as the worst film, worst director, worst script. But I was disappointed I didn't even get a nomination. I'll get it one day. <laughs> Honey, I Shrunk the Audience. It's a 4D film, which means that it's filmed in 3D. You're wearing glasses, but everything happens in the... Th they're building special theatre for all these effects, about 25-minute film. She didn't land on anyone, did she? Rick Moranis was in it. We shot it, and it was kind of interesting, because you had to do it with long takes, like a play, because they were adding in all the special effects. Then I got to write one, which was Pirates in 4D with Leslie Nielsen, and I wrote some jokes, you know, for what the pigeons go overhead and they they drop water on people's heads and they think they're going poop on their heads. Now, we shot that one in Puerto Rico. It was really great fun on our pirate ship because Leslie insisted I was in the movie or he wouldn't do it. And so we had a lot of fun. <laughs> the Meaning of Life we had the most trouble with because we didn't know what it was about. I always when Python, we didn't know what we were doing. We just said, well, let's just start writing and see if something emerges. And so we start writing bits and pieces and it, became about an expedition to Afghanistan, World War Three, sponsored by advertising. Uh, and it, you know, it had so many good bits and pieces, but we couldn't for the life of us determine what, what was the, the film was about. And I said, I think what this could be about is the meaning of life. And they all kind of like that, because that applies to almost everything. It's got so many great parts, which are still very offensive, I'm happy to say. Uh, vomiting and <laughs> blood, <laughs> liver donors. <laughs> There's a couple more scenes missing of that character, because I, I remember, he's, he's just, you know, what's the matter with you? I've oh, lost a leg. Quite a bite you've got there, isn't it? Yes. Real beauty, isn't it? He's very indifferent to pain. And then later on, I think there was a lot of scene where he goes, he says, are you all right? Yes, yes, I'm jigging about a lot. He said, well, are you OK? He said, yes, just feeling a bit horny. <laughs> he's lost his leg, but he's really, the jigging about has made him horny. I don't know whether they still have that. Some of the things got lost. Um, maybe it's in the outtakes, I don't know. <laughs> Front heads of the tie, got Michael at the back end, was he? I like that because it's about lying. We were, we were, we were coming down through, hey, you decided to take a lift on the back. There's a pro czarist, a shanty chief. Uh, no, 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 no. No, why, why are you really here? And they won't, they never tell you why they're there dressed as a tiger. And so it's a perfect Python thing. The whole thing is talking about why are you dressed as a tiger and never explaining it. This is all about being funny, avoiding answering the question of why you're dressed as a tiger. Doesn't matter why they're dressed as a tiger, have they got my leg? <laughs> I think Gaston was a gift from Terry Jones. Terry Jones was directing the, the whole film this time. He gave me two parts, I think. One was Gaston, and one was the Protestant wife. Ooh, we've had sex twice, and we've got two children. You know, it's very sweet playing a little northern lady, because I'm from the north, so I like those little voices. Gaston was like French, you know. He's a French writer. Come with me, come with me. There's a big long lead in. We take him all over the bloody place and he starts to abuse the camera and the audiences. It's, it's a gag on the audience, so it's nice. Fuck off. Well, the man in pink isn't really a character. He, he sings the Galaxy song, which is uh, one of my favorite songs, which I wrote with John Dupre. And I'd written all these lyrics about the universe and the size of it and the scale of it. And well, who was going to sing it? And then I thought, well, I'll wear something extravagant. So I got a, a pink outfit made. And I think we got a silvery wig. And he, I don't think he talks, he just sings. There's not a lot in the character so much as the, the song, delivering the song properly, which is kind of sweet. He takes Terry Jones off into the universe as this little old lady and brings her back. Oh, I feel much better now. Yeah, you can have my liver. <laughs> We're 30,000 light years from galactic central point. People write to me say, those aren't the facts. And I say, they're not the facts anymore. I wrote the fact in there in 1982. And they were the facts then. It's science that's changed its mind, not me. 
And I get a lot of shit from Professor Brian Cox. He's a particle physicist and a cosmologist. And so he's always giving me shit saying, that's not the true facts. And I did a gag with him in 02, where I got him run over by Stephen Hawking, which is my favorite thing ever. This one major physicist running over another one in his wheelchair. I don't look for characters. I fired my acting agent 20 years ago because I don't want to be in films. I hate it. I'm a writer. That's what I like to do. I like to think things up, write characters, and get other people to do them. And that's much more fun.